Today's show is brought to you in partnership with Adreno Spearfishing Supplies. Adreno is one of the world's biggest and best spearfishing stores. You can visit Adreno online at spearfishing.com.au or in store at their Brisbane or Sydney locations. G'day guys, today we have an absolute cracking interview for you. We are interviewing Rob Gates. Now Rob is now lives in Australia, but originally he is from Zimbabwe. So we're going to hear all about Rob and where he started in Zimbabwe, spearfishing in Lake Kariba for a bunch of different species that I've never heard of, like uh, tiger fish, wundu, and electric bobble and electric bottlenose. So these are a couple of uh, electric species that uh, Rob encountered when he was starting out. We also talked to Rob about spearfishing around crocodiles. So he had two run-ins in his lifetime with crocs. So it's an absolute cracking interview. Now Rob's also a comp diver and he came 17th I think in Spain and he also made the top 20 divers in CMAS 1985. So he's uh, he's got a lot of experience and he knows his stuff. So enjoy, you're in for an absolute cracking interview. wanted to share awesome experiences that you can have when you are in the water and that's why I started spearfishing. I just clamped down on the reel and got drugged down to about 50 feet and I'd never had a battle like that before in my life. So when you're learning where to hunt and find fish, they're the hot spots, it's where fish want to be. Don't overcomplicate your gear, don't go diving dressed up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> I actually started off in stubbies with a bloody belt with a pig knife on it. And I'd seen this big fin break the surface, bowl in the water, look down, here's this nice big great one. Oh, 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 oh. Once your face hits the water and you feel relaxed and all the other stresses of life seem to disappear. It's a whole new world and it's mysterious, it's magical. Beats the shit out of knitting anyway. Oh yeah. G'day Nilbers. Today we are interviewing Rob Gates. He's originally from Zimbabwe where he started freshwatering, freshwater diving over 40 years ago. He represented the country in world titles in, in Chile and Spain and today we're going to talk a bit about croc attacks and shallow water blackout and all sorts of good stuff. So welcome to the show Rob. Hi, how are you? Good, mate. Thanks for coming on the show, Rob. Rob, uh, just to get started, could you tell us a little bit about uh, where you got started spearfishing? Well, I started spearfishing in, a, in, a, in a Lake Kariba, which is in Zimbabwe. Uh, it used to be Rhodesia. Um, when I was 13, um, there's all different uh, awesome species in, in that lake. Uh, tigerfish, Wundu, Chesa, and Kupi. Um, there's over, over 50 different species. Uh, visibility is about... Uh, about 10 meters, um, and there's all different types of terrain, pebble bottom, wee bottom, uh, diving underneath the water, hyphen, um, over the water, sand bottom. So, yeah, it was, it's a pretty interesting uh, diving spot. Um, it used to be on the Seamus Diving Federation venue for all divers to dive competitive if they wanted to come over and dive in our competition. But, uh, yeah, it's um, pretty Pretty awesome spot to start. Uh, started young and uh, got into all sorts of trouble with electric barbel. And uh, there's, there's a few different types of electric fish in the lake. Uh, one is an electric barbel and one is an electric bottlenose. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and hang on, you got into trouble with them. What, what, what happens? Are they electrocute you? Do they? Yeah, they electrocute you when you shoot them, or if you are holding on a rock and you scouting for fish, they see your fingers as, as bait and they come up and just charge you. Charge you, you know. And- Really, and what uh, what what sort of shock are we talking about? You know, like putting your tongue on a battery, or no, but but um, about six thousand volts uh, electric <laughs> bottle. So, so it stuns you completely. Um, and then your your bottle nose, if you um, hold the nose and the tail, it gives you about two thousand volts, which also is a good shot, you know. So that's a real real risk when you sort of at depth and that happens to you. <laughs> Yeah, you know, a lot of guys have um, been black, you know, had a big, big knock like that, and and been blacked out for a couple of seconds in the water. Wow. Um, I took a couple of big charges. The one one time I was diving in uh, the Zambezi River, which is the big river that runs right through Africa. Uh, uh, it's below the dam wall, so it's the river is actually governed by the power station, which feeds the river. And uh, so there's lots of turbulence and lots of eddy currents. And I was shooting a, a yoni salmon. Um, and uh, what happens with an Inyani salmon, if you, you shoot it and you pull it out of the shoal and you lift it, lift it out of the water, um, the shoal will swim right up around you. Then you, you can icky it uh, and just 
put put it out of its misery, and then you can body string it, and then you can shoot the next one. And because they they stay right around you, the minute you lose one, they will just and it takes off. The the rest of the shoal will follow it. You know. So I was doing that, and I had shot about I think about four at the time, but I was moving shallow and shallow to make it easier. And then uh, I was right there in the shallows, holding the rocks and just waiting for the next one to come up. Um, and I, then I got nailed. And I did, got stunned and I was up drifting in the current for a, a couple of meters thinking, well, what happened there? You know, then I realized there must have been a powerhouse. We, we used to call them powerhouses. Okay. Yeah. And the, the, came to my senses, swam up and I looked underneath and in this cave below, there was a, a big powerhouse, a little bubble. And <laughs> there's nothing you can do with that thing, you know. <laughs> yeah, it is quite funny. Man, you've you've had a really different background than a lot of yeah. the guests we've had on the show. It's really good to talk to someone who's done significant freshwater spearfishing. We've been wanting to get someone on the show for a long time. So this is really sounding like 50-plus species in freshwater. That's not something that we would connect with diving in freshwater. So, and you've got electric fish and all sorts of crazy stuff going on. I'm enjoying this already. So... Look, what 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 was um? I mean, you've talked about the electric bobble and getting the the crap sort of shocked out of here. What what was one of the other memorable sort of fish you remember when you were just starting out? Well, there's a there's a big wound, a catfish called a wundu in there, and uh, they they get to like 45 kilos. That's the record, and wow. you normally find them around about 17 to 25 kilos. That's the common size, and uh, they they actually like to come and lie next to you in, and when you're lying on the bottom. Sometimes the visibility gets down to probably four or five meters. So you know, and then and it's and it's dark as well. You can see, but it's still dark. And you land on the bottom and you silhouette. The idea is not to move around at all. Just as you hit the bottom, there's no cracks or uh, holes that you have to hide, and you just basically lie on the, on the bottom of the mud. And yeah. uh, they will they will come down and they'll just nest next to you and they'll lie next to you. So. Before you go up, you normally turn around and look around, and then you know you see this thing lying next to you. You get fit of fright, you know. And he takes off, and you take off, you know. <laughs> um, but the, the other big thing, like um, you know, with diving with crocs, and uh, what they do is the crocodile likes to um, have a strike zone, and they and the, the other big um, diving is, is diving under the water ice, and under the water ice, and it's normally a lot cleaner, um, and it's, but it's dark, it's black. And the crocodiles, crocs like to make a, an, a breathe hole where the kudu or the impala or deer will come down and drink water from. And that's normally okay. the spot. That's normally one of the spots that make the light get you get light underneath the the cabbage, you know, underneath the weed. So a lot of so many times I find myself actually in that breathe hole, you know, and I realise I'm in mean, actually uh, the crocs, uh, <laughs> you know, attack the attack area, yeah. you know, and you just pull it out of there. The other, the other crazy thing as well is, is when you're diving in those lakes, you get these hipper piles, and it's just like somebody's gone along with a lawnmower underwater through through the bush, you know, through the the felt, and yeah. and 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 you've got weed, weed either side, and they're normally about a meter, two meters wide, and again, it's a hell of a beautiful uh, corridor of fish because the fish just swim up and down, uh, eating the the hipper trails and stuff, you know. Oh, and wow. so there's, there's, and then obviously you know there's a chance of you coming across a hippo when you're diving down that that path, you know. And they're, they're quite dangerous as well, aren't they? Yeah, they're very dangerous. So they 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 actually, you know, they've got huge teeth and they bite they bite you. They just you know go right to you. Um, I I, is, I read somewhere that they they kill more than like four four times more people than crocs. Is that is that right? Yeah, they do. Yeah, it's. Um, they're very protective of the young, and they're very territorial. So, okay. and a lot of people, you know, canoeists, you know, they, most of the people that get nailed are people that are canoeing down the river, or fishing, um, putting nets down in the rivers and stuff like that. You know, and they, and they hate fires uh, around campfires. They come, they hate the fire, so they come and try and stamp the fire out, and then that's when they um, nail a whole lot of people sitting around the campfire. You know. Yeah, wow. wow. Yeah, wow, that's incredible. What was probably the first memorable oh. fish that you you shot, took home and ate? Oh well, um, that was the electric bobble with Dion Dion Van Eyre, a school friend of mine. And it was inside a log, and that was the very first fish. And that was eight kilos, and shocked shocked the hell out of us because we didn't know what it was <laughs> at the beginning. So we, we tried to pull it out of the 
you know, you try and you get so so stoked that you want to shoot the first fish, you know, you want to pull it out, and then it, it nails you, you know. <laughs> you know, you, a bit of a wake up call for the first, you know. But there's there's um, beautiful tilapia, the tilapia that they call feral fish here in Australia. It's, yeah. it's a it's the number one fish in pretty much all over the world. It's um, and it's a really nice eating fish. I mean, I've, I eat it here in Australia. Um, it's really a beautiful white. Fish, mm. fresh fish. How do you, know. how do you prepare that fish? Um, my dad used to cook it amazingly, just or, just by filleting it. You can just soak in a bit of milk, milk. Um, and then my dad, what he, what he, and I've tried to do it so many times because it doesn't come out right. Um, but um, you just pan fry it in in, in butter, okay. um, and then just before it goes golden brown, you whip it out of the pan, take some garlic. Chop some garlic into the into the pan, put the f- fish back in, and as the the garlic is just about cooked, you squeeze lemon juice over the fish, turn it a couple of times, put it on the plate, and use that uh, that gravy sauce for the the garlic and the lemon butter over your chips. You know, it's white, it's like coral. It looks just like coral trout, and, and it tastes really yeah yeah. I wasn't hungry before, but I am now. Rob, what's the um, you speaking about Lake Kariba? What yeah. is it? Is that catfish the largest species in that lake system? Yeah, yeah, Vundu. It's called the Vundu. Yeah, there's, there's also other really um, awesome looking fish too. You get the, the purple labia congoro, which is a um, beautiful purple, deep uh, like salmon shape. Uh, it has a, a mouth um, like the the carp, like a like a hoover. And it sucks. Yeah. And what you do is you can see, like, uh, if you're stalking it and you're looking for it, you'll see the. It makes like a. Is it, if, you, if you could do visualize taking a. Making an arc with your finger, like a shape of a C, C, C going forward. That's how it sucks along the bottom across the rocks. And, in, and you, look, you look for that and you see uh, there's nice fresh suction marks on the, on the, on the, over the boulders and stuff in the shape of a C going forward. Then you know they're there. They're, they're really, really pretty. They're beautiful purple. Then you've got the bottle nose, which looks like a bottle, like a long thin tube face. You've got Cornish Jack as well, which is also very uh, unusual looking fish, you know. And then you've got awesome. fish too. When you when you got started there, Rob, what were some of the common obstacles you had? Did you have a mentor? Were there other guys doing what you were trying to do? Yeah, the, the biggest the biggest problem was uh, nets. Um, you know, get swimming and getting caught in nets, um, and then obviously. And finding out where the where the crocs where crocs have been seen, um, and that's about it. Yeah, crocs, hippos, and nets sound pretty dangerous. That sounds like some significant obstacles. And, and um, powerhouses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, good fun. Yeah. yeah so. Okay. Cool. So, um, I mean, you're in Australia now. You've been here for seven years. Um, you enjoying our spearfishing here, Rob? Yeah, I love it. I've always. Always dreamt about coming to Dalva Bay Bay Reef, and that's why I've moved to Dalva. Uh, that's for, that's what I'm here for. Yeah, to, right. to enjoy the, the crystal clean water, you know. Um, okay. And what what sort of um, hunting techniques and things like that have transferred over from you know your freshwater experience in in, in Lake Kariba to to Australia and the Great Barrier Reef? Um, very different, uh, you know. First of all, you know, you, there's no, you don't have uh, the big surges and stuff like that, um, and then the, the the biggest thing is is the visibility. You know, a fish is comfortable with seeing you from far away, so it doesn't, you know. And for me, it, it took me a long time because I would just sit in the bottom and wait for the thing to come to me, and and it would it would frustrate me because they wouldn't come any closer. And then the guys say, "Well, now you, you need to swim and stalk it and go down these gullies and." So it was such a big learning curve to to, to get out of that habit because you focused on, on certain concepts and sitting dead still, motionless, um, and now suddenly you have to get up and swim around and duck through caves and go through hollows and and it was a big big difference, you know, it's a big difference. You know? Okay, cool. So you got so some of your skill set sort of transferred, okay, which is waiting and being still and all the rest, but you've really had to learn how to stalk. So what, yeah. what would you say your favourite hunting technique is now and, and how do you apply it effectively? I think the, my favourite one is um, burning up um, and then finding hotspots where uh, Spanish are going to come. Uh, 
just having a look at the different species. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of techniques um, that are found where, whereby um, if you're diving along a reef, um, there's a lot of dead spots. And I find that a lot of the spirits that I dive with actually start herding the fish. They start, they dive, dive, dive. They don't see any fish. And then suddenly they see see some fish. And then they keep diving at the same speed, that, that, like every every 20 feet, 30 feet, instead of slowing the whole concept down, saying, um, because I, and, and, I, and I call it herding, um, fish are living in that certain area, and that's where they're happy with. And suddenly you start bouncing through it. They will go, they go down to the deep, or they go right into the back of the shallows, wait for you to pass by. Once you pass by, they come back to do the normal thing in the same in the same area. And and I when I when I come across a pocket of fish, I, I'll dive in the same spot, even if I have to dive there three or four times to make sure those little fish are all comfortable, they're all relaxed. And when they relax, the bigger fish are relaxed and they come back. That's what I find. Okay. Cool. So I put don't hurt fish. Allow allow the the smaller fish to to get comfortable with your presence, and then um. And, and 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 yeah okay and then you and then you can sort of encourage the fish's natural inquisitiveness I suppose yeah yeah hey Rob um, I've spoken to you on a different occasion about um, about burleying and you could you just share with us um, what burley you use for pelagic fish I, um, I know you talk, talk to me about fusiliers yeah I remember talking to you about it um, for for sure that. The best burley um, for reef fish is reef fish, um, and and vice versa for pelagics. You've got to use game fish to to lure them in. I mean, and and what also really works well in in clean clean water is actually uh, toilet paper. You break toilet paper to little pieces. Um, take maybe fifteen toilet rolls and throw them in a bucket and just mince it up. And when you drop it in, we use this this burley. Uh, Chick in Vanuatu, and you could see the paper, the little pieces of paper for miles, and we we soaked them in um, in tuna oil and stuff like that, and the fish came up to it like crazy. Yeah. That's a great trick. <laughs> that's an awesome. That's an awesome hunting technique. Guys, if you're after more podcast action, go and check out our mate Jason Selms over at AustralianHuntingPodcast.com.au. He talks all things hunting, shooting, and fishing. It's a great listen. He's getting plenty of downloads. He's big in Canada, South Africa, even Japan. It's fantastic. Jason talks to experts in the field on all things shooting, hunting, and fishing. It's really, really good listen. So go and check him out, australianhuntingpodcast.com.au. The Australian Hunting Podcast is the only hunting, shooting, and fishing podcast radio show in Australia. With over 40,000 downloads per month, you are sure to find some information that can help you. If you love hunting, shooting, fishing, and a little bit of politics, the Australian Hunting Podcast has you covered. To listen, check us out on iTunes and visit australianhuntingpodcast.com.au. All right, Rob, um, I've, I've spoken to you before about your scariest moments, but... Um, but, uh, mate, could you share with us uh, your scariest moments uh, out spearfishing over there in Lake Kariba? Yeah, no. Um, first of all, the, the, I, you know, diving with crocodiles is uh, um, not the nicest thing to do, but you get so passionate about spearfishing, you just jump in anyway. Um, but I was, I was, I took a, um, the first time I got uh, nailed by a croc was, was in a, you know, competition to make, make the Zimbabwe team to go to Spain. And uh, I was diving in a very, um, very shallow spot, uh, and there was a hell of a lot of wind activity, so it made the water pretty uh, chocked on the one side. So I swung, I swung, swung around to the, the other side and was diving in about 15, 20 feet, chasing uh, a different type of tilapia called a happy. And uh, and I was on the bottom and looking around and. and because I'm diving in such shallow water, instead of going straight up for air, I'd swim off at an angle like 45 degrees. So I, um, I um, took off and I felt something just tug on my fin, and you know, and I had the long fins on, uh, and I, I knew I'd already left the bottom, so there was no suction of mud sucking the fin down, and I, and I didn't see any sticks, so nothing. I didn't think anything was you know 
could could have been caught on a stick. So I turned around and went back down to see what it was. But I went back down with my gun facing me straight in front of me, and I came straight face to face with about a twelve foot male croc, um, big fat <laughs> sick neck. And I just took one look at it. He was such a surprise too. So I went backwards and tried to shoot him through in the through the collarbone into the, the heart and lung, you know. Yeah. And um with a big fat thick neck and the big jaw, I shot it into that. But it went in about fifty to hundred mil and it stopped it straight. It didn't it wasn't happy about that. And it started to go backwards. So I I just stopped swimming and I just went underneath it and celebrated it above me and I could see it shaking its head left to right to to try and get the spear out. And I didn't know what I was going to do after that, but at least I was away from it. Then when I saw it turn its belly to to duck, I, I, I ducked as well. And the boat was right above me, and I jumped in, into the boat and then pulled the, the spear gun back towards me, and it's when the spear pulled out. It's all the swirling that. That was the, that was the first one, you know. <laughs> so um, the second one was a lot worse. Uh, I don't know if you want me to carry on with the second one. Mate, please. It's uh, it's very entertaining. I'd love to hear about the second one. The second one's the crazy one. Yeah, the second one is I took a South African team up from to go and compete in the the nationals, and I went to one of my favourite spots. I took my family there so many times, not realising that a female a croc had moved into the area, and uh, we jumped in, and I was working towards the water house, and there was trapped in between the trees, um, also in about 25, 30 feet of water, and so. It was very, my very first spot, so I thought I'd just warm my lungs up uh, and have it like maybe five hours before I get to it. Because when you're underneath there, you, it's very difficult to know how how deep the roots are um, and what are the what are the dangers are in there. There could be a net stuck in there. There could be other branches and trees that you've got to try and get out of the way once you shot a fish. So you know you need to be really prepared. So I go along and have a couple of dives, and um, I shot one Mozambique bream. Gave it to my mate, and and I thought, well, let me see if I can shoot another one, and then I'll just let the other guys go and get my other skirmishing buddies. Um, so I thought, no, let me rather have one extra dive. Thank heavens I did that because that dive, I went underneath the water house, and I stuck my head in, and I went in there about about three, four meters, and I just lie on the bottom, and it was it's pitch black, you know, and your eyes start slowly to climatize. and about seventy, probably about seventy nilotics. Tilapia just suddenly just emerged out of the darkness towards me. I'm sitting on the bottom thinking to myself, I'm going to shoot all of these at once. So I thought I'll shoot the first one through the tail <laughs> and then and then double up, get it, get, get two. And it, it didn't work that well. I got the one. And as I swam out of the water house and, and from underneath the cabbage, I just felt this, this knock on my leg. I looked down, there was a female crop just holding, trying to gnaw, trying to get, get a good bite, but put most of its power into the blade. So it didn't know what it was and couldn't get a good bite. So my knife was right next to the mouth. So I pulled out the knife and tried to stab it on its eyes and, and on the front of its head, on its head, but it's just bone. So I managed to flip around to a jackknife underneath it and stuck it in straight into the throat. As I put it in the throat, it just opened its mouth and let me go. It came up next to me with the mouth wide open. I thought, oh, well, that's it. So it's going to roll off the knife and go. So I thought, well, I'll give it a bonus shot, which is the worst thing to do. I pulled up the knife. As I pulled up the knife, it just spun its head around, boom, and latched onto my my whole arm, swallowed my whole arm. <laughs> so wound up again, stuck it in again, and in its throat as I put it in, stopped straight away, opened its mouth, and that was it. But this happened all in, like, you know, split seconds. Yeah. And then managed to have the well, that's it. I better push this thing away. So I just pushed it away, not and not letting go of the knife, because that's all I had, you know. The gun was unloaded and pushed it away, and then I just bolted backwards in my boat. My boat was right there, jumped in the boat, um, lie there, and then, then took off, went to hospital, got it all stitched up, you know. Wow. Yeah. It's insane, isn't it? <laughs> that's yeah, two, cracker, two cracker scary stories. Um, we, we've had a few croc stories, but nothing like that. That's that's it's terrifying. Amazing, eh? Did um, did you have any more scary stories, Rob? <laughs> no, 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 no. 
I was diving with the, in the, in Transkite, which is a beautiful area too. A lot of the spear, South African spearers, Tommy Butter and uh, Jakob Blissnoch, where they all operate down in the Transkite area, and these huge fish yeah. there. And there was I mean, it was it was the migration of the the ragged tooth sharks coming up, and uh, I said to my diving buddies, look, let's let's get. Uh, there's this one one species of fish um, called um, uh, what's it called? Um, uh, I can't remember the name of it. I said let's just get ten of these because it's you know that's good for the pot down and dust. Then we'll go for some pelagics. Um, and but there was a lot of big raggies there, but the real big round raggies. And I thought, oh, well, you know, let me I'll have to just choose it. Choose a shot. When I looked around, there was no raggies, and I plugged one. Cuckoo bass, that's the, that's the fish. So I was swimming up, and this thing suddenly slowly turned up to come and bite the cuckoo bass. And when it got to the cuckoo bass, the cuckoo bass didn't want to get eaten. He <laughs> took off left. And <laughs> this thing, radar, just it lost its radar, and I decided, no, well, the, the cuckoo bass, well, what he's chasing is my fins. So I came up slowly and tried to bite my fins. <laughs> now I've got nothing. I've got an empty barrel. I got you know. <laughs> I'm just trying to pull the the fish up to, to to kill the fish, and and I'm actually got the line in front of me that and the barrels down the back there. So I'm, I'm kicking it away, and I need to kick it hard enough, and it turns around at that same level. Probably only goes about five meters and spins around and comes straight back. So I'm managed to get the barrel back to me now, and I'm. <laughs> Bang it on the head with the barrel. That's all I've got. And, and turns around slowly and then buggers off and then thinks, now nah, come back again. There must be something. So I think to myself, we're going to have to break the barrel on this thing's head. Make sure <laughs> this, thing's, this thing's not nearly, you know, four, four meters. You know, it's a big jog. So as it comes, I hang my legs right out there so I can get a good smash at it. And as it comes close enough, I hammer it. And it took off down into the deep, gone. So I was pretty stuck about that. Get in the boat. Now I'm really <laughs> rattled. So I'm sitting in the boat, drifting in the, with, the, with the boat. And I eventually get in the water uh, about half an hour, about half an hour later. And uh, not even knowing, the mate of mine, Toby De Fleming, he shot a, shot a raggy because he, he wants the jaws. So I'm we're talking about, talking about 18 years ago. So, um, yeah, yeah. And What's a, ra- mouth, what's a raggy, though? The, oh, the raggy, shark. raggy yeah. tooth shark yeah. is the um, is that like our grey nurse? The grey nurse. Tooth shark? Yep, that's it. That's the grey nurse. Yeah. yeah. So, but now it's dead with its mouth wide open. So, I'm in the I'm in the, I'm in the water and and he's he's pulled it around towards me and he shouts to me, Rob, I'm my, one of my fish is just about to get off the spear. Can you can you shoot it so I don't lose it? Well, I turn around and I just see this mouth looking at me right here. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> I took off backwards out of the water. So, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah, you, know, you feel so funny. It was quite scary that as well. Three so, cracker scary two, stories. Two there. crocs and a shark. It's yeah. not bad, mate. <laughs> I wouldn't keep tempting fate. Oh, my, yeah, hey, bloody hell. Yeah, our, our show's all about just attracting people to the sport, and you've done a good job. No, no, sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that was all good. That was good. That was a good story. Hey, guys, really excited to announce that we have a special offer for all Noob Spiro listeners. Pete Ryder from HowToFreedive.com is offering us 20% off all his courses. I have just finished the five minute freediver course, which is aimed at enabling you to hold your breath for five minutes. I'm at the 4 minute 15 mark. I haven't hit those marks in a long time and I, I find this course to be really well structured, really easy to follow and I'm getting some great gains out of it. It's the course that Turbo and I both wish we had done starting out. It just saves you so much trouble and hassle. Use the code NoobSpiro to save 20% on all of Pete's courses. He's put together this deal just for listeners of the show. That's at howtofreedive.com. Use the code NoobSpiro. So, um, look, the next part of the show is called Veterans Vault. So this is where we ask you, our special guests, to take us deep into an area of expertise. So we were going to talk about blackouts and uh, some tips and tricks when guys start to dive at depth and how to develop a bit of awareness around some of the hazards in both fresh and salt water and how they're different as well. Yep, yep. 
So for, let, let's start with blackouts. So I, I remember before the show you talked about, um, you know, the difference between blackout and fresh and, and salt water. There's some difference in symptoms. So can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, in, in fresh water, uh, and like I said, it's, uh, it's totally different. For when, when the blackout uh, starts to occur, you get this sound of crackling uh, in your ears. Um, you get a salty taste, a rush of salty taste into your mouth, and you, you get the tingling feeling around your mouth and, and your fingers. That's the only thing that you get in, when you're in the sea. You get the tingling around the mouth and the fingers. The, the other two are gone. And so, um, you know, and it's such a fine line, you know, this, you're talking only a couple of seconds either way. So, um, you know, as, you, as everybody knows, when you just about to break surface, that's when, when it all occurs, you know. Um, and just to go off on that, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna feel like you're gonna black out, rather take your weight belt off and uh, and just hold it in your hand. So if you do black out, um, you drop it and you get to the surface. Most important, now, you know, I blacked out a few times uh, in Lake Kariba as well, and um, and the, the fortunate thing about it is, well, we learned with all of us diving up there is. You need to take the first breath. When you when you break, when you break surface and you take the first breath, everything starts to recreate itself, you know. And yep. uh, so, but that's you're still 45 seconds away from seeing the benefits of that that breath, though, as well. And when when and when you do free diving courses, they sort of teach you that. But I mean, so you come to the surface and you take that first breath, but you're you're still going to black out. Is that what happened to you? Yeah. Um, well, I blacked out underwater. You know, I didn't just didn't get to the surface. I was I was motoring up and then just stopped swimming and went back down. Um, and then fortunately, um, we were we were we were training to go over, um, and we were doing two minutes on the bottom, two minutes on the surface, two minutes on the bottom, just getting that repetitiveness. And I was just sitting on the bottom for two minutes. I was probably my third dive, and my mate, my buddy above me, realised that I wasn't up, and he was his time to go down, and the water wasn't clean. And and he went down. He didn't see me there, so he thought, well, maybe you know, um, I passed the rope on the way up and all the one on the way down, you know. And he got up to the surface and I wasn't there. Then he realised I was down. And fortunately, he swam straight down, and there I was lying on the back on my back on the mud, and, and he pulled me up. Wow! And after about eight and a half minutes, I started breathing, you know, after bashing my chest and <laughs> wow, and mouth to mouth, and, and got me going. Then I went into hospital for. For two days, which I was upset about because I was wanted to go and spare this the next day. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, had to, I had to get all those water off my lungs. You know, uh, you know. far out. Yeah, Eight and a half it. minutes with no air. That's uh, I can yeah. see why you're in hospital a couple of days. Yeah. So, so in freshwater, you get you get more more symptoms. Um, you, that's you get interesting. More symptoms. Yeah. And so when you transferred, so you started off more in freshwater, and when you transferred to saltwater, is that when you experienced your next blackout? No, I haven't. Uh, I haven't had a blackout in in the saltwater. I I don't push myself anymore. I I work out how deep I want to go, and um, and just better my technique to to get the fish. Um, you know, if I can't get it this time, then then my technique wasn't right, and okay. uh, that's basically what I try and do. You know. So we've talked a bit about. About blackout, what are some of the other hazards you've noticed with, with particularly with young guys starting to take on, um, you know, big depths and things like that? Yeah, I think the I think the 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 fins are are a big risk. Um, you know, before you look around, you you can be at you can be at thirty meters with, with these big new fins, and I'm not saying they they are they're bad fins. They are beautiful. They're amazing amazing uh, bit of gear, but you've got to realise that you've got to also go back up. And uh, you know, and there's a lot of youngsters that are living on the mines. Um, they have a week week off. You know, they haven't done much diving. They've been working in the coal mines or driving dump trucks or whatever. And they, you know, get into a ute and tear off to the coast and say, right, we're going to go and dive. Everybody, everybody wants to shoot quality fish. And and these things happen, you know, um, especially when it, when when they meet up with a spearer that has that has been diving for the last three weekends. And he starts shooting more and more fish. So the other guys start pushing themselves, you know. And they say, yeah, "Well, okay. gee, you know, well, Jack's, Jack's getting to the bottom. Why can't I get there?" And there's, there's a, it's a long way back, you know, after 30 meters or 45 meters, you know. Yeah, and yeah, that's, definitely. That's, that's, so 
I don't think enough has been, um, don't think enough has been uh, emphasised on that point here. Yeah, well, we're we're seeing it more. We're seeing, um, you know, we we talked with um, Ian Puckridge not long ago, and he identified, you know, like particularly in Queensland, um, you know, when we're heading out quite wider in boats and stuff, we 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 do seem to do a lot of deeper diving, and um, you know, past sixty, seventy feet, and you know, it's not unusual to hear guys that have been diving, you know, only a couple of years, and they're they're pushing some some serious depth and. Um, other people have theories that your physiology takes time to adapt and there's age and all these other things, but, um, yeah, nothing, nothing hurts, um, you know, like providing people with a bit of awareness around some of the issues, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that also, and this is not something to go by, um, I think different, you know, different people have different blackout, uh, points. It's not, not that everybody has to go and, go and try and see when he blacks out, but. And like you said, you know, a lot of people have, um, are more advanced um, in that in that area of um, breath holds and stuff like that, you know. Yeah, you notice that when you do proper freediving training, and I mean, freediving is not spearfishing, but we use freediving to do spearfishing. But when you combine the two, like it's – anyway, but like when the freedivers, they, they understand their bodies to a pretty fine point. But they don't have the complications that we have with, you know, that they're beautifully streamlined. Um, yeah. That's all they're doing. We're taking spear guns, dive knives. We, yeah. we most of us use crap snorkels, and the, you know they're not hydrodynamic yeah. and, at all. And there's fatigue and repetition. I mean, the fly yeah. divers aren't out there for five or six hours in the boat going up and down all day. You know. Mm. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's sure. you know another huge thing. Yeah. So while while the free dive training is essential, like being aware, if if yeah, they're, they're, some of it doesn't cross over that easy. So yeah, no, good 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 stuff, Rob. Um, what else did you want to ask for Veterans Fault Turbo, mate? I thought. Um, well, I think we we were going to talk about freshwater hunting, but I think we sort of covered that, didn't we? Yeah. Hunting techniques. So um, yeah, I think we sort of. What else, what else with fresh water, Rob? Um, so we were going to talk a little bit about the sport, and it's sort of um, it's probably gone under the radar a little bit. Like everyone's aware of saltwater spearfishing, but what what are some of the benefits uh, to spearfishing in freshwater? Oh, there's, there's there's not a you know it's, there's a lot of good eating fish there for a start. I mean, what what are most spearers die for to eat quality fish? Um, but then and then it's the the fight of the fish. I mean, the vundu big big uh, Hard fighting fish, tiger fish take off like a racing snake. You know they <laughs> they very very quick under the water, very hard to shoot. They 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 swimming style as well. All you know all fish in the sea and in fresh water have different styles. So that that was a big challenge. You know trying to trying to get our numbers um, and our competitions were whereby we had ten of a species. So you know you know certain guys could shoot a lot of tilapia, but to get to know how to shoot a, a bottlenose or a Cornish jack or a Koopi or a Vundu or a Chessa or a Purple Matsaka or a Nyani Salmon. They all live different habit, habitats um, and that was the competitive side of it. And yeah, okay. we, like in the sea here, you know, spearfishing competitions in, in Australia are very different to the other places that I've dived. We, um, you know, in the world champs you dive, there's only, there's, there's a block out of, of species and then you shoot doesn't matter how many you can shoot, you just boat them. Whereas Australia, it's one species over two, one one fish over two days. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, so that that again um, uh, doesn't lend itself to a lot of lot of spheres that want to compete and and uh, and actually take part in clubs and diving clubs and stuff like that. If they if they lifted it to two two different species, like in South Africa, you have two species two. Two of a species, and guys like Tommy Water, Yaku Blissnote, we're, we're weighing in 40 species. Wow. You know, that's <laughs> operating. You know, this is not world level sparing, you know, and, and with the concepts of shooting Bonita, shooting Muscle Cracker, Dog Salmon, and um, um, all that kind of different species. And that's that's where Lake Reba had all those different species other than the sea. And so that's pretty awesome, you know. Mm. Some, a lot of the freshwater spear fishermen these days are. Taking out invasive species, so like in New Zealand and Australia, we have carp. Although, is is freshwater spearfishing banned all over Australia? I don't know. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Apparently, they have, apparently they have in Cairns one spearfishing competition a year, 
which they they are they are trying to eliminate the tilapia. Okay. And um, which is which is good. I'll definitely go up and join that and, and dial that comp. But they they could have it all over the country. Um, I think it'll yeah. be good for good for sales. It'll be yeah. good for the for the the health of the community, the youngsters. And yep. it's, a, it's a really healthy way of living. Um, it's exciting. It's full of adrenaline, and uh, yeah. and uh, yeah, I love it. I think sometimes freshwater spearfishing, like chasing invasive species, would be a, a prob- possibly a better environment to learn spearfishing because the water's a bit more settled. Like you said, you, unless you're diving in a river, there's not there's no current. Uh, yeah. We don't have. I mean, we do have crocs sort of starting at. Uh, you know, at a, at a certain point, and then further north. But um, yeah, no, it's it's, it's an interesting one. Um, so we, we've got a few listeners up in the Greater Lakes in the United States, and they they talk about spearfishing there. It's just a different world. So now it's good to talk with someone who who who's doing it. Today's Veterans Vault was brought to you in partnership with Penetrator Fins. Spearfishing is all about self-improvement, but there are some things you can buy off the shelf that are going to help you with your diving. Penetrator blades are lighter and more reactive, and they've improved my diving, and I'm sure they're going to improve yours. Yeah, I've recently switched over to Penetrator Carbons, and it's made a big difference for me. I put much less energy in and get a much greater output, meaning that they are an effective fin. They are lightweight and comfortable, meaning that I spend more time on the bottom. So check out Penetrator Blades at Penetrator.com or check out our new Noob Spear Edition Penetrator Blade at NoobSpear.com. Moving on to the next section of the show, the funniest thing. What's the funniest thing you've experienced out spearfishing? Uh, it was a, a madam on Gary Howard. Uh, we were diving in, in, uh, in Lake Kariba where by... Um, I shot a, a, a bottlenose, which is what I was telling you about, had the, the 2,000 volts. And uh, but he, he, whenever we were talking, he was a workmate, and whenever we were talking, there was something surprising. He'd go, he'd just go, Hacha, like that, you know, like, as opposed to not a laugh, but like a cha, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and it was unusual. But anyway, um, I, I took him up to, to drive the boat for me the one day, and and I was plugging away, plugging away, and I came across this bottlenose of about eight kilos, and I thought, wow, oh, this is going to be good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I plugged the thing, and I came up to the, and I just, I didn't want to touch it because I knew it was going to do so. I just said, to him, Gary, just take this fish. Uh, there's another one. I want to go, just give me another gun and just take the fish. I just dropped the whole fish with the spear in, into the boat, and he gave me another gun, and I started swimming away, and, and I heard the fish bouncing up and down. So I said to him, said him look, you, if you want to kill that thing, just grab its head and, and the nose and just pull it, you know, to break its back, you know. So yeah, hold the nose. And it's a real thin, <laughs> the real thin uh, tube nose and, and the tail. He has to hold it and I try and break its back and then, you know, it, you'll, you'll kill it. And then I just heard this. <laughs> 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 oh, <glory. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> All on the boat, I look over and he's so wired, eh? <laughs> he's oh, got you me uh, I couldn't dive for a while after that. Just get up. Just get up. That's what it's all about, too, Rob. Sorry, yeah. those stories make oh, diving. Right. Bloody hell, that's funny. Oh, man, I wish we had that fish here now. Awesome. All oh, right. So now you're in Australia, you're up diving the Great Barrier Reef. What, what, um, in your dive bag, Rob, what, what, what are you wearing head to toe? Oh, just straight fins. Um, I try and dive as very, uh, um, as low uh, compact as, as possible, just straight fins, fin trainers, booties, knife on the one leg, um, mm-hmm. quick release weight belt, um, nothing on the weight belt at all. I've actually uh, made up my own weights, which are round as well, so I don't catch on anything, not square. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, and then I've got just the ordinary gloves with a, uh, a knife, which is on my arm, my forearm. Yep. And... Uh, Hoodie, wetsuit, and that's it. I don't dive with the dive watch. What brand suit are you using? Are you using a Stinger suit or? Yeah, I'm just using a Rob Allen now. All right. 
You use Rob Allen gun as well? No, I use my own gun. I'll make my own okay. gun. What do you got, a Woody? I use, no, I use, uh, I use Annecy. I make my own barrel. Okay. And, oh, nice. uh, with a spear in it. And it's a larger barrel, so the spear actually sits on the barrel. And mm-hmm. so there's no rail. And it's, uh, okay. it's an amazing gun. Yeah, it makes it told me to, to actually make more of them because when you're diving, you don't have to, it doesn't sink. The, uh, if I'm diving in 10 meters of water, I can just let it go and it just sits next to me. If I'm diving in 15 meters of water, even with the float line on it, I let it go and it just hangs there right next to me. If I'm diving in 5 meters of water, it does, does the same thing. Just so with what, the rod. Uh, you know. What sort of timber did you use for that barrel, Rob? No, it's alloy. Or is it alloy? Yeah. Alley tube, yeah. Yeah, he's just making his own out of components. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, nice. what, what diameter barrel is that? I think it's a 42 outside. Yeah, wow. nice. Yeah, it's a nice heavy round barrel, too, you know. It worked with yeah, Pete cool. in one of the shot some nice doggies there, and I got a really nice um, wagon as well. Ah, oh, sweet. Yeah, nice. Yeah. <clears throat> I've got a half-finished gun sitting here in the corner. I really got to get around. It's not to... half-finished, Rob. Yeah. It's probably twenty percent. And uh, <laughs> you know, this thing, this thing started at least twelve months ago. Uh, yeah. It's a, it's a stock of wood. It doesn't even look like a gun. Hey, it's... Wake up to yourself, Turbo. Excuse look. me. This is going to be one of the finest guns ever to be seen, mm. honestly, when mm. I do the other 80% of it. So, uh, yeah. just, I've had a bit on with the podcast, all right? Please. Anyway, <laughs> moving another, on. There's another concept in the Lake Shariba, which I haven't told you about, which is probably uh, the best concept, and that is actually diving in the trees. And they, have, um, they have all these dead petrified trees in, in the water, um, and there's small branches you have it in the lakes as well, in this country as well. Yeah. And the guys go bass fishing around them. Yep. What actually Snags. happens? Uh, uh, yeah. And what happens is the the fish eat, eat the the tilapia and the all the different species of bottlenose and all that. Uh, and they eat the algae that's on the branches. Yep. And you can you dive underneath them, and there can be you know 60, 70, even more fish up in a tree. They're just sitting there like ducks in the tree you know it's quite like, we've yeah. actually we've got a dive spot off off brisbane like that um there's a rock wall and there's a couple of trees that have been pushed in over there and uh the, the coral growth on them is phenomenal like any structure you end up with in, in yeah. water it just seems to become a, a congregating place for fish so it's interesting it crosses over in a fresh as well yeah hey rob the tilapia because you say you've said that you, there, there'll be 70 or whatever fish together at a time can you yeah. do? Do they once you shoot one? Do they like, r- rapidly get a like a flight response? Do they bugger off or do they school around? Yeah, they, they, they take shooting? off. They're gone. Yeah, they take off. Yeah, unless you, you know, what you can do is you can scratch the bark and you can shoot the one stone dead and it falls falls out of the tree to you and you swim away. You go back up, you pick the next one off, next one off, next one off. I haven't. Uh, my best is like uh, seven out of a tree, but I have a mate of mine that yeah uh, shot seventeen out of one tree. <laughs> it's, just, it's just harvesting. It's real serious harvesting, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd love to see that actually. Yeah, that'd be fun. I'm, I'm fish get, falling out of trees. It's awesome. I'm looking forward to getting into the fresh water. Sounds yeah, good. I know, but I, I don't know how keen I am going with crocs actually. Yeah, no, I'm not keen on that at all. No. The um, all right, Rob. Uh, we might move on to the fast five facts for noobs. So, if you could give us your five pieces of advice for new guys starting out. My five, my five would be pair up with a diving buddy that can dive the same depth as you um, and they've got the same interests uh, in safety-wise. Secondly, it would be to have a, uh, to dive with a minimum of one knife or better, two, two knives. Uh, and of about the blade, it needs to be a double-bladed knife. Um, and so you can cut both ways and, and not a... Not a Killing knife, but an actual one to stab a croc or a, or a shark. And um, that'll be six to eight inches. Free diving course, um, to do the free diving course, which is the right way to go about it. Mm-hmm. Picking the, the right uh, diving gear to, to suit your face uh, um, in different currents and, and fin retainers so that you don't lose your fins in, in the washing machine or in uh, the surf. Yep. And the last one would be to. Do not mix sports. 
dive with a crayfish bag and go crayfishing or go spearfishing with a spear gun and leave, leave the crayfish bag on the boat. Okay, and awesome. because, the, because the crayfish bag can get caught on the reef and, and easily drown, yeah? That's awesome. Yeah. All right, yeah. so I've got um, Buddy up, and I think you, before the show you talked about having a dive plan as well, so I think that goes well with that. And yeah. number two, use dive knives. So you've talked about an eight-inch blade or six-inch blade so you can actually stab something with it if you want to. Yeah. And um, number three was do a free diving course. We went over blackout pretty extensively in the um, Veterans Vault, so, I mean, that goes right in hand-in-hand hand with that. Number four was get the right gear for your environment. So, and you, you've talked about fin retainers and surf and stuff. Number five was be careful mixing sports. So whenever you're trying yeah. to... A man who chases two rabbits catches none or whatever. Like, a, and, and I suppose you add to your your risks as well with all the complications. So cool. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. Awesome. Um, we're going to try and link up some freshwater spearfishing videos in the um, in your show notes, Rob, just so people can get an idea. Maybe um, if you've got some good footage for us or or you know of some good footage, we'll be happy to link that up. But um. Okay. Yeah, it's very intriguing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. To think that you can pull such quality fish out of fresh water. And because here in Australia, we've got good quality freshwater fish, but we're not allowed to spear them, generally yeah. speaking. Mm. So it'd, just be, it'd be absolutely awesome to be able to go out and shoot Murray Cod and Yellow Belly and all those kinds of things. Yeah. So look, apart from maybe learning a bit more about um, freshwater spearfishing and what, it, what that's like, Rob, is, was there anything else um, you maybe want our audience to come and have a look at? What about parting advice? Parting advice, um to have a dive plan and enjoy the sport. It costs a lot of money to go out and dive. And share, share you know, people, I think, uh, the older divers and the younger divers, if they can, if they can share their knowledge and the different techniques um, because it costs a lot of money to go out and dive. Um, and the, the time is, is is very, very short. You know, you, the amount of time, amount of diving time that you get, you actually get in during the year Um there's really not a lot, a lot, of, a lot of time to actually learn how to dive and how to shoot quality fish, and, and a lot of spearers actually fade off and, and wander away from the sport, you know. And I'm, you know, I try to promote the sport as much as I can. I, I'm also begin to promote underwater hockey. Um, cool. I started I started under, underwater hockey in, in uh, Toowoomba, and uh, I said to the guys to, to keep it to keep it going. And I said my vision was to actually get it into the, the cur- curriculum. In, into the schools, and they've actually done that. Yeah. Oh, awesome, awesome. We actually yeah. recently interviewed Sean Hartley from the Cairns Craze Club. Okay, okay. And, and he's given us a full rundown on the benefits of underwater hockey for spearfishing. So if you if you haven't heard that episode, to listeners out there, go back and listen to that. It's an absolute cracker. So I will no do, worries. I will. Yeah, excellent. Cool, and uh, thanks for sharing your time with us, Rob, and um, and, yeah. and um, sharing your tips, wisdom, and stories with the next generation of Spiros. It's uh, really Thank good to have you on the show. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Awesome, mate. Thanks so All much. All right, Dave. Eh? Thank you. Thanks so much, guys. We hope you enjoyed today's episode with Rob Gates, guys. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure talking with him. He's always got a story to tell you. So, uh, yeah, thanks to Rob, and thanks for listening, guys. Our next episode is on six actionable tips to increase bottom time. So that's part of our 101 series. So uh, tune in for that, and we hope you get something out of it. Shrek, why don't you tell our listeners how they can save some money on spearfishing gear? Well, Adreno have partnered up with Noob Spiro to offer listeners $20 off all purchases over 200 bucks. And how do they take advantage of this deal, mate? Uh, listeners can use the code Noob Spiro at checkout online at spearfishing.com.au, or they can use it in-store at the Brisbane or Sydney stores. Excellent. And that code is Noob Spiro. That's right, Noob Spiro. Thanks for listening to today's show. Make sure to leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. And to learn more about becoming a better Spiro, visit us at noobspiro.com and subscribe to our newsletter.